you have your Bibles this morning, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'd ask you to please uh, try to get near a Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you don't know where that is, try to be near somebody that has a Bible. I think it's important for us to look at the words of God. They say in learning that as many senses as, as you can get involved, uh, that helps it retain. And so as we're looking at the Word of God and also hearing it, I think that helps it to sink in. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll look at maybe a couple of verses in chapter 2. If we don't get to it, then next week we'll uh, continue on with some of these thoughts. There's a, a story that I thought was funny. Many years ago, they used to have butchers if you know what that is, you know, you have meat shops. Now you kind of go to a butcher shop or a meat market, different things like that. But it used to be in the old days that butchers would come and deliver to your house. And so there was a, a mom and her little boy named Johnny who were at the house and the butcher was going to be making a delivery. So the mother was waiting for the butcher and he was late, kind of as typical. And she had some other things to do. So she said to Johnny, I'm going upstairs. If the butcher comes, let me know because I need to talk to him. Well, Johnny forgot who it was that was supposed to come and who mom wanted to talk to. So the minister came to the door and he shouted uh, to mom. He's like, mom, the man you wanted to talk to is here. And the mother just was upstairs and she yelled down and says, I can't come down now. Give him the money out of my purse and tell him we didn't like his tongue last week. So we're going to change. Now, uh, I just introduced that because uh, we're going to be talking about preaching and preachers over the next couple of weeks. And I think that in our society, there's a misunderstanding about preaching. There's a, a great book that was written many years ago. I think now it's 70 years old. It's probably the classic uh, written uh, for preachers. It was called The Preacher and Preaching. And I'm going to probably put some excerpts of that available and send it out through church email. Because in his day, so 70 years ago, he was harping on that there is a disdain for preaching. And I was reading that. I was thinking, well, you have... You have nothing to say. You can't believe what it's like now. 70 years later, uh, now it's just straight entertainment. If somebody gets up and, and preaches, and if they're uh, a little bit rambunctious, if they're a little bit excited about something, then, like, what is, what is wrong with him? But God, I believe, in scriptures, highlights preaching. That's why even in our church and uh, here, it was interesting to me because here is this man writing 70 years ago and he's from England and he was writing that even in our society, and this is him writing 70 years ago, he said, it's been a, it's been a custom recently that in churches that now they are starting to move the pulpit to the side. You'll notice that when you come in here, the pulpit is front and center. You know why it's front and center? Because the preaching is what is the most important thing in our service. It's what God honors. And you may say, well, why is that? We're coming to that in our text. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. In this passage, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth, and in fact, many years ago, there was a few of us that were able to go on a trip to Corinth. We walked through the streets of Corinth, we were able to go up on a hill to what is called Acre Corinth. And Corinth was not a very good city. It was a very wicked city. In fact, Acre Corinth, when you walk up the hill, we had an unsaved guide. And as we walked up uh, the, the streets, there was a cobblestone entryway. And as you would go into the cobblestone entryway, you could see the different empires that had controlled Acre Corinth by the way of the entrances. He told us to look and you, you could see the Ottoman Empire, you could see the Roman Empire, you could see the Greek Empire, because they all had different characteristics of how their architecture was. But the, the unsaved guide, he was not a Christian, 
The unsaved guide said, well, just so you know, historically, this road right here, going up to Acre Corinth, up on a hill, it was a lookout area. He said, more than likely on this road, there would have been a thousand, put that in your head, a thousand temple prostitutes that would be lined up here. So you would have to walk by them to go into the city. You know, sometimes we think that we live in the most wicked time. Sometimes we think that we, oh, sin is just, it was bad when Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. If you read in the passage later on, read the book of Corinthians and you'll see that there was homosexuals in Corinth. Because he says, and such were some of you. Right? Which goes against those that believe that a homosexual can't be saved. Right? Because Paul tells the church of Corinth, and it's under scripture for us here, it says, and such were some of you. So it's saying that some of you had that because it's sin. Okay? But you were saved. That's the power of the gospel. But notice what it says here. So he's talking to this church in Corinth. It's wicked people. And there's a big discussion because there was a lot of division. And that's why he's writing some of the church, because a church should not be divided. It should be unified. I'm not talking about uh, other churches. I'm talking about us as a church. There should be a unity in our church. And so he's addressing that because there's a division. There's divisions among them. But then notice in verse 17, Paul picks up and he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to do what? To preach and to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, wise, and it will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? That is a, a quote from, I believe, Isaiah. Where is the disputer of the world, of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God. Notice what it's called. By the, you say the word. All right, so notice what he says. It pleased God by the, of preaching, to save them that believe. So I understand some of you sitting here, all right, and I would ask you, all right, we've had a, a number of rumblings over the last uh, few weeks, so I'd ask you, when it comes, I would ask that, and we're going to address this in just a few moments, when it comes to our church services, all right, maybe you're a young person here, and we're going to address, I think, some of the problems that we have in our society and why there's a disdain for preaching. I would ask that when we come to a church service that you come with some respect. I know that's not taught today. I know it says that you are the most important thing, and actually uh, there's nobody more important than you. There is, actually. It's God. God is the most important person, and Honoring Christ is more important than what you think. And so as we come to Scripture, notice what it says, that the preaching to the world is considered what? Foolishness. It's foolish. So when the world says, well, why, why don't you come up with a better way? Because this is God's way. And the world says it's foolish. So what if they say it's foolish? They also say that abortion is okay. They also say that immorality is okay. They also say a whole bunch of things about morals and a whole bunch of things about drugs and alcohol. Do we also, do I say, well, I've got to follow that too? No, we come back to Scripture all the time. And Scripture says that it is preaching and the preaching of the cross that should be a priority. Notice what it says again, for the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But what do we do? We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, it's a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks, it's foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, 
Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And then go back down, uh, go down a little farther. It says in verse 29 that why are we doing all this? All right, even as a preacher, I'm a preacher. You know what a preacher is in this world? A fool. So what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to change what I do? Well, in the world's eyes, it's still going to be foolish. And that's why I think even we're taking as our theme, but I'm unashamedly a fool for Christ. Why? Because we're going to preach Christ. Why? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Some of the reasons why it's foolish is because there's something in man that we want the applause of men, we want recognition, we want, we want our egos built up. There's even preachers that do that, and that's why, like even tonight, I was talking with Joel, and it came out, but even tonight, there's going to be times that we don't live stream, and we're not even recording. You know what? I'm not preaching to the universe. I preach to you. It's not what I prepare. I don't prepare my servant sermons for the TV audience. Okay, well, if you're wondering, we don't go on TV. But I'm not, I'm not preparing it for YouTube so I can get a thumbs up. I'm not doing it so that I can be liked. No, I'm preaching Christ, and most important, first and foremost, it's, it's for us right here. I am not called to pastor America. I am not called to pastor Indiana. I am not called to pastor all over the world. I am called to pastor right here in Chesterton. And we will preach Christ. And we'll preach Christ crucified. And we will be unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? If the world thinks it's foolish, well, no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Look at verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And I love Paul, his epistles. I can't, every time I read them, it just seems like there's more and more and more that comes out of it. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the importance of preaching the importance of preaching. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us as a church to understand that preaching is important. And preaching is sometimes different when we come to Scripture and look at it than what we picture it in our mind or in our thoughts. I pray that our preaching can be aligned scripturally and our thinking can be aligned scripturally so that, Lord, we will not glory our flesh will not get the glory, but Lord, you would have the glory in all things. Lord, as always, do that which I can't, and that is speak to hearts. We ask and claim your power, in Jesus' name, amen. So why is preaching important? I mentioned this I, as we start out. So a little longer introduction, and then we'll just have a few points to consider. So why is preaching disdained today? Why is there a, a lack? And I'm saying even, even uh, in our, uh, we've been talking about it because young people will come in and we try to outreach in our community. But I was talking with our bus folks uh, yesterday morning. And guess what? Uh, those sitting in here, if you don't want to sit properly in our church services, what I'm going to ask you to do is not come. Why? Because the preaching of the cross is very important. And guess what? You and a whole bunch of the world thinks it's foolish. Why am I got to sit here and get up and hear, hear some guy get up there and talk about the Bible and talk about the Bible and talk about the Bible? Because we obey the Bible. So why is preaching disdain today? Well, one, because our culture has moved away from the authority of God's word. 
And as our culture gets away from this, then when I read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and you can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you can read the book of Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, and you can read in those books, and what you'll find is a whole bunch of instruction about preaching. In fact, one of the classic passages, I think, is 2 Timothy 4, which it says to Timothy, a young man, and he really wasn't that young. Most believe he was in his mid-30s. But here, Paul was talking to Timothy and saying, preach the word. So guess what we're supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be talking about this book and not just talking about, we're preaching it. And as the authority of this book gets moved aside, guess what we start not liking? Preaching. You know, why can't they do something else? Well, then we try something else and our culture is. So now we have drama night. And so then we're going to come in and have drama night. I'm sorry, that it's okay, but we have a music night, but it's not on Sunday. You know why it's not on Sunday? Because Sunday is God's day, and he says, I want you to preach. And the preaching is going to be preeminent here in our church. Why is preaching preeminent? Because God says it is. And you can come up with all kinds of other ditties. You can come up with all kinds of other things. And you know what? I appreciate good music. And we should praise the Lord, and we're teaching on it. But I'm sorry, when the music is the priority in our church and not the preaching, then something's wrong. The preaching is the priority, not the music. Because preaching is what God says, the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the cross, and we're going to talk about that next week, because right in this passage, it tells us what to preach. The gospel and Christ crucified and the cross. Now that's pretty broad, just so you know, and we'll find that out next week. But why do some of you not like preaching? Because guess what some of you don't like? I ask you, some of you that don't like my preaching, I ask you, did you read this book this week? I bet you the answer is no. And if it's no, then I say that one, you may not even be saved. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. I was too. But through the preaching of this book, I found out about Christ. Without the preaching of this book, you will not find out about Christ. Christ is the living word. We have the written word and we have the living word. And between the two of them and the preaching of it and the authority of this book, guess what happens? We find answers. We find a way to heaven. So preaching, why is it disdained in our society? Because the authority of this book, it's it's mocked. All right, you... Uh, You say you hold to the the word of God, and we're like, well, come on. I actually believe that God created the heavens and the earth. That's what I believe. I don't believe in evolution. I think think evolution is a fairy tale. I do. I think it's a fairy tale. I think that our culture lives in a fairy tale world. And some of it is because of Hollywood. Hollywood. Some of you sitting here, you've been inundated with Hollywood, and guess what? You think that the movies you watch are real. That's how silly you are. You see, like, oh, look what he did. That's fake. And because that is in our heads, and it's, I mean, some of you, when you walk out of here, maybe on the, on the bus that you ride home, you're going to pull out your phone, and you're going to watch something because you can't live without it. It's fake. This is real. And when we have pushed aside that which is real and we have accepted that which is fake, guess what happens to our society? We start accepting what our society says. And now our society says, who is that preacher? Who's the preacher? It's what God has ordained for this time. It's what God has ordained through his church to be a vehicle 
to spread his word. It's what he's blessed. Why is preaching disdain? We're just going to think of two ideas. The first is because our culture has moved away from the authority of the Bible. The second reason that preaching is disdained is because there is no longer a fear of the Lord in our culture. There's no longer a fear of the Lord. You say, well, is the fear of the Lord important? Oh, yes, it is. If you don't have time to turn there, I'd like you to maybe list out a couple of verses. Okay? I just want to show you why the fear of the Lord is important. The fear of the Lord is important because God says it is. So here's, here's three passages. Isaiah chapter 11, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and Psalm 147. There are tons of other passages. In fact, if you want to do a study of the fear of the Lord, you can study it all through the book of Proverbs even. Where Proverbs, I believe it's chapter 1 and verse 7, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if our culture is pushing away the Bible, so that's foundational, then the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. So if I have pushed away the Bible, and in the Bible it says that without the fear of God, I can't have wisdom, then guess what we have as a society? A bunch of stupid people. Yes. And guess what? We talk to them every day. We talk to them every day because they're like, oh, well, I heard this. I read this on the Internet. <gasps> wow. I bet you that's really researched. What we have to be careful of is getting away from Scripture. So what does the Bible say? Isaiah 11, verse 1, 2, and 3 says, and you'll see who this is talking about. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, I know this sounds deep, okay? And a branch shall grow out of his roots. So in Isaiah 11, 1, so it's talking about a rod out of, out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of the roots. Guess who that is talking about? Anybody know? It's Jesus. This is talking about his birth. So Jesus, this is foretelling of Jesus and his birth on this earth. So guess what it says? Verse 1, guess what's going to come? Through the prophet Isaiah, he says, there's going to come this person named Christ. Verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. So guess what the Bible says, that the Christ that came to save our soul, guess what he had? The fear of the Lord. You say, whoa. It's in Scripture. Right in Scripture here. He had the fear of the Lord. So if I'm going to be like Christ, guess what is going to be a part of my life? The fear of the Lord. We're going to continue on. There's no fear of the Lord in our society today. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The wisest man that ever lived, according to Christ, on this earth, writes this at the end of his book. It's a very, it's a very um, carnal book in some regards, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a very, a, a very worldly book idea that Solomon is bringing across, but then he comes to the end and he says, what's the whole conclusion of the whole matter? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Whoa, wait a minute, Solomon, what are you trying to tell us? Well, the Bible is telling us that Christ, when he came down to this earth, he was it was, it was brought upon him and he grew and he had a spirit in him of wisdom and understanding because he had the fear of the Lord in him. Solomon says, 
Hey, you can try it all. You can have it all. But the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Psalm 147 says this, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. So why is there a disdain for preaching today? Because we have discounted the word of God and because there's no fear of God anymore. How do I, how do I know that? A fear of God is kind of a, a holy reverence. It's not uh, somebody has defined the fear of God. If you look at the fear of God through the book of Proverbs especially, it defines it a lot. Fear of God usually has three combinations. It has love of God, reverence of God, and submission to God all wrapped up in one. And so when I fear God, I love him, I reverence him, and I've submitted to him. All three of those are involved when you study the fear of God. So how do I know that there's no fear of God or there's a lack of it today? I see it even creeping into our young people, even our older folks. How do I see that? All right, let me give you a simple illustration. I was talking to our bus folks about this. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be mean to our, our young people here, but you know, um, even at the song service, I was looking out. We're, we're coming in, and this is church, right? And when we open up a songbook, what are those songs? All right, the last song was Saved by the Blood, 210. So I was watching a little bit. I knew I was preaching this. So 210 comes up. I saw a couple people. Uh, actually, the, just so you know, that wasn't a reenactment of could you please stand and take your songbook. That was a reenactment of the song being sung. We're singing about being saved by the blood of the crucified one. And I can't open up my mouth and praise God? I can't sing out? Why? Because so-and-so's watching me, and you've got to understand, I got, I got an image. Actually, your image is supposed to be conformed to Christ. You're supposed to have the fear of God in you, and that means that you love him, you reverence him, you submit to him, so it doesn't matter what anybody else in the auditorium is doing in comparison to God seeing me. So when I stand there and say, I can't sing because, you know, I don't know. Maybe you're not saved by the blood. Then I understand it. You're not saved by the blood, so you have nothing to sing and praise God for. You know what else I see? It's crept in. Because we ask people to bow their heads and close their eyes at an invitation. If I have the fear of God and I understand the importance of preaching, then what was the word of God supposed to do? It's supposed to be for me. So during that time, because I fear God, when, when, when we say bow our heads and close our eyes, at that point, I don't think it's time to go to the bathroom. That's not what I'm thinking. Because if that's what I'm thinking, the whole time that we've been preaching, you've been thinking about the Word of God. Oh. Yeah. Or maybe you're a young person here. I've seen some of our church folks here. I ask to bow your heads and close your eyes. You want me to come down and poke your eyes out? Now, I've calmed down over the last couple dozen years. But like, but what does that say? It's invitation time. Didn't speak to me. I also have an image. And you know what I notice with people that do that? They never come and kneel. Why? Because there's no fear of God. The fear of God says, I love God so much that when the preaching is 
start it up. I don't care what else is going on. I zone out. I zone out all that noise. And I'm zoned in on the word of God. And I just want God to speak to me. And you know what? I believe he does. I feel bad for some of you that sit in here. Because I do. I get some nice notes, some nice thoughts from folks that sit right where you sit or sit. And those of you that sit and say, God never speaks to you, the person right next to you, God is. So are they lying? Or is it that you never are in tune enough for God to speak to you? Because the mode of God speaking to us, yes, there's a couple other things. I believe God, and that's biblical, I believe that we believe in the priesthood of the believer. I can step into God's presence in my my personal devotion time, but there's something in the Bible that is blessed when we come and we preach the word. And when we preach Christ crucified, it's foolishness to the world. Why? Because they don't like the authority of God's word. They don't have the fear of God. And how do we not see the fear of God? Because sitting in church, we think of it just like school. I've had young people tell me this. Well, I do this at school. You know what I tell them? This ain't school. The last I checked, it says right out front, Fairhaven Baptist Church. And a church is not a school. It's a church. It's an assembly of God. It's what God blesses. And the preaching that it's done, God blesses it. So you can do whatever you want in your school. But at church, we will honor God. We will honor him. We will reverence him. Why? Because we unashamedly stand for the preaching of God's word. Let me close with just a couple of thoughts from our text here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Believe it or not, that was all introduction. So we'll skip some of our other parts and just give you, we'll come back to it next week. Because the, the study of the word preach or preaching is interesting in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you have a number of different types of things. The word preach is only found three times in the Old Testament. And I think each of those are kind of unique. And so I wanted to touch on them, but maybe next week. And then in the New Testament, we have the first preacher. The first preacher in the New Testament. Meek, mild man. Kind of soft-spoken. Negative. The first preacher in the New Testament, you find him in Mark chapter 1. John the Baptist, first preacher. And guess what? He jumps on the scene. He doesn't just like meander on the, I mean, he leaps on the scene. And guess what his message is? The baptism of repentance for the remissions of sin. Jesus, his first message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I don't have time to delve into that, but there are some guys that get bent out of shape and the word repentance. I love the word repentance. You know why? Because Jesus loved it. Because he preached it. His first message was repent. That means turn. Turn. I mean, his first message was turn or burn. All right? Turn or burn. Well, guess, guess what we have in the Bible? We have preaching. So what does it say in preaching in our text here. Look at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So we see a couple points come out of this text for us about preaching. What does it tell us? Christ-centered preaching uplifts the cross. And if it doesn't, what happens? It makes the cross non-effective. That's what it says. He sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. If I get into the pulpit and it's all about me, and I'm not following God's way, 
Guess what preachers can do? They make the cross non-effective. That's scary. I don't want to be a preacher, and I don't want to be in a church that makes the cross non-effective. The one thing it says right there is one of the things that makes it non-effective is your own wisdom of words. You know, there's some guys, and I try, you know this, I try to read, I try to study, and you expect me to. I, I should not be a doofus. I should be in the book, and I should read, and I should study, and I should work hard. But I'm sorry, my message is not, um, my, my message is not some prose or poetry. You're not going to come in all the time and be like, oh, wow, it sounded like Shakespeare. One, you'd be like, what is up with that? But preaching is a lot different. It's not like literature. Preaching is not literature. You know, my, my sermons, uh, you know, we, we try to transcribe some of them. It's impossible. You know why? Because preaching isn't literature. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't have English and we shouldn't use it properly. But preaching is not with the wisdom of words. It's with the power of God. It's the power of the gospel. That's what we use. And I ask God to empower it. So Christ-centered preaching uplifts the cross and it makes it effective. Notice also, it says, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Cross-centered preaching reveals the power of God to the unbeliever and the believer. You know, I have some po folks, and my wife knows this, I have some folks that don't like to come at certain times of the year. I, I, I've, I've talked to them. They don't like to come at certain times of the year like, oh, you're just going to be preaching on salvation. Like, I love hearing preaching on salvation. That's actually kind of what communion is about. Then I, I take it you never want to take communion. Why? Because, oh, you know, I already did that, done that, all right? Been there, done that, you know, it's done. I, why do I got to remember? Because actually in remembrance of me, he tells us to. So by me rehearsing sometimes when I hear salvation, it reminds me of that great salvation. And how maybe I have taken it for granted. And how I need to share it with somebody else and that maybe I was selfish and not bringing somebody to church or not. Maybe there's somebody in my family or somebody that I know and I wasn't bold enough to share Christ with them. I can't imagine saying, well, you know, uh, that's just, he's just preaching on the cross again. It's not, it's the power of God to the believer and the unbeliever. To the believer, it's the power of God for you and I to have victory in this life. To the unbeliever, you can have victory in the next life because that cross paid your debt. Christ-centered preaching uplifts the cross, makes it effective. Cross-centered preaching reveals the power of God to the unbeliever and the believer. And notice in this uh, passage, for the preaching of, um, or verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Wise. And he goes through this, and he tells them that it's foolishness. In verse 25, uh, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than the men. Than men. For ye uh, see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Christ-centered preaching is contrary to worldly wisdom. It's different. And that's what I think we have to understand as a Christian. I'm not saying if we are idiots because of our, our actions, right? And by that, if I, I think we should work at having a little bit of culture, right? If I, if I came in and I'm at the restaurant and uh, I sit down and uh, I'm loud and boisterous, they drop down my phone like, ah, ha, 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 right? 
and people are starting to stare, and then I'm, I'm grabbing, let's say, you know, it's a, I think of a big turkey leg, you know, and I'm grabbing, yank it out like, ah, <laughs> give me that one. All right, and people are looking. I, if you are an idiot when you eat, you deserve to be called an idiot. All right, just so you know. If you have no manners, I, you burp all the time, you have no culture, you sit there and your, your big bowl of soup comes out and you're like, <laughs> you know what? Yes, you're a fool. And I think all of us say you're a fool. And it's not because of the cross of Christ. It's because you're just a fool. All right? You need a joker hat on. All right? And you need, you're a doofus. I, but as a Christian, there are some things that are marked on us when we are saved. That makes us, the Bible says it's a peculiar people. That word, I think we, we take it and, and we make it sound so bad because really being peculiar sounds weird. But really it means that we're different. We're strange compared to the world. We're distinct. When God comes in, he makes you a new creature. And so then there are habits. There are there's verbiage, there's vocabulary that goes, there's habits that go, there's places I stop going, there's people I stop seeing and talking to. All of that happens because of Christ and the preaching of the cross, and it makes us foolish to the world. And then worldly wisdom comes by and says, well, I mean, before... You were saved. How much money did you have in the bank? And for some people that were saved, beforehand they had a lot more money. So to the world, what does that sound like? Well, you're a fool. But see, the Bible, I come back to the cross. The cross, the gospel, Christ crucified gives me a different perspective of everything. Because in Christ, I am all in all. That's what the Bible says. In Christ, I have everything. The, the world says, well, that's ridiculous. Why? Because their father, the devil, says this world is all there is. In Christ, he has made me understand, no, it's not all about here. There's eternal life. And Christ has given me that. So see, the preaching of the cross, if I don't preach the cross, I'm ineffective. Christ-centered preaching or cross-centered preaching is the power of God. Christ-centered preaching is contrary to the worldly wisdom. And then Verse 31, that, add, uh, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. I cannot take any credit for anything that comes because of the preaching. You know why? Because we preach Christ. So if any good happens, and this is what happens, uh, that remember I said this author, and I was reading some of it yesterday, it was just interesting to me because here he was writing 70 years ago. And then in some of his illustrations, he was talking about 150 years ago. And he said, you know what happened in America 150 years ago? All right, for me, it would be that. For him, it was 50 to 70 years ago. 50 to 70 years ago in America, they instead, instead of having preachers, they had pulpiteers. I guess that's like a buccaneer or a musketeer, and then you had a pulpiteer. And he was swashbuckling with his sword, all right? But you had a pulpiteer, and he said, and instead of people coming out of church saying, wow, did you hear about our God? They said, did you hear his speech? May God help us to not have a place that people say, wow, those words. Instead, they say, wow, what a savior that church serves. That's what our preaching should be pointing to. 
It's pointing to Christ. And when we come into church, that's why preaching is a priority. And it's important. Why is it important? Because we're going to see over this month, preaching is highlighted in the Bible. It's a high priority. And yes, like I said, I love our music. I love all the other things. But when it comes to our services, it's the preaching that is the priority. And it's not just man's wisdom. It's not just my ideas. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about pitfalls of preachers. But then I'm going to get on you because that's, that's pitfalls of preachers is my side. But then I'm going to talk about pitfalls in the pew. Because there's some dangers on both sides. And all of us know it. All right, I know people that get up and basically the word of God is what food they like. Like, ah, bless God, you know, talking about turnip greens. I'm like, all right, I'm, am I supposed to say amen to that? I don't know, amen. All right. all right, I don't really care about your turnip greens. I don't care about your food. I don't care about, I don't care about your preferences and, and all kinds. I don't, you know, and there's some people like, hey, and some of you drive them Fords. I don't care about what car you drive. I really don't care. The last I checked, well, I guess Ford, some, somebody has found Ford in the Bible. All right? But guess what? I, I don't care about what car you drive. I don't care about all those different things. That's not what I'm going to preach from the pulpit. What I'm going to preach from the pulpit is this book, Christ Crucified, the Cross. That's what's important, not pettiness. And pettiness ruins our pulpits. Pettiness has cheapened our pulpits. And so now the color of my shirt or the, the, the stripe in my suit is on the same level as my Savior on the cross. No, it ain't. We will preach Christ and we will preach him crucified. Why? Because that's the power of God. Let me close with an illustration. Christ-centered preaching changes lives. I read this story. This amazed me. There's a man named Ken Mansfield. Ken Mansfield was the U.S., on the U.S. side, the manager for Apple Records back in the day. If you don't know what a record is, they're a little bigger. <coughs> you put them on this thing. Just think of them as a large CD, which CDs I know are going out. But Apple Records was the Beatles' um, that was their producing label. So uh, this Ken Mansfield on the U.S. side, he was the manager basically for Apple Records for the Beatles label. Ken told of the wonder of being the Beatles manager, the prestige, the fame, the money. He said it was a great life until the band broke up. He said, and then everything just started like in a, a crash. It was like a, a tsunami of problems and heartache. A lady that Ken Mansfield knew was a Christian. Eventually, he ended up marrying this lady, but she got him to go to church, and he got saved. This is what he said. Before committing my life, this is his words, before committing my life to Christ, the Billboard magazine was my Bible. Record charts were my God. Prestigious positions was my purpose. And he said, all of that changed when I found Christ. He said, after my conversion, I realized how hollow and how empty the Beatles and managing the Beatles was. He said, they, he said, the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost became my authors of the map that I needed for my journey. I needed a chart, a journal with clear direction, a log to refer to, a guidebook, and I found all of that in my Bible. And that's my desire in preaching. My desire in preaching, and there's some sitting out here, you have found that, because in the, in the wisdom of the world, you sank all your life 
into possessions, prestige, whatever else. And in the wisdom of the world, you had it all. But you know this. You're empty. It's hollow. And my desire is through preaching of Christ crucified and this book. We can turn people from the silliness that is in this world to a Savior that can change them, not just for eternity, all right, and that's great, but he can change their life here now. Because this is the power of God. And we will preach this, this book and Christ crucified. And my prayer is that as young people and older folks, and our nation, it wears us down, and I think it's wore us all down. You watch, you watch a film or you watch some TV, and it's just little innuendos, little innuendos, little innuendos. And you know what happens to this book? It lowers in my esteem. And my fear of God lowers. And I come to church and I start thinking, mm, I don't know, is it that important? Yes, it is. It changed your life. It made you different. Then don't go back to that world. Let's be unashamed of the gospel of Christ.